the one thing about Stubbs Bridge, which is interesting, is it kind of happened, it kind of fell into place. We didn't sit down and say, we're going to write a song this long. Um, the opening part was a wonderful, uh, Tony, Tony Banks, a Banks guitar piece. And because he doesn't play guitar very much, he chose a shape I would never have chosen, because it's just a weird finger movement. But it worked, you know, that's, that's been part of our sort of pattern, really. And then the instrumental section at the end, which became a big part of, our, uh, of the song, kind of happened one day when we just, it wasn't a plan, just jamming around in 9-8, and I had a riff, dun, 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 you know, and Phil was drumming around the rhythm and across it, and Tony started playing, and then the end section, when Peter came back with the vocals, um, one of those rare moments when you, you, we had no idea what was going to go on there. Was it instrumental, was it vocals? It wasn't, we weren't sure, really. And he came in and sang this incredibly powerful line, 666 in the end section, and actually, it kind of happened before we knew it. Whereas some music sections are a bit laboured. You've got to work at it and push it. This one just sort of seemed to actually just become a wonderful piece without too much effort. The thing that, that's very striking about it is a, there's a kind of emotional content, emotional depth to it, uh, which means that it does have this in, Sort of power, it's kind of it, I feel it's like everyone in the band is at their best. Instrumentally, some of the playing, some of the music, the sections Willow Farm, which is very much Peter's section, you know, and then some of the other sections, which is more myself and Tony. I think all the best bits of what we were doing at that time were in that song. And it, uh, it's luck too, it held together. You never quite know, you joined things up, you know. And, our, and our, 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 the way we work, which is often to join. Goodness me. That's not me. No. That Claim that ring. Sorry, folks. I don't think it's me, no. Yeah, it's just cow person. Yeah. So it's up, there you are, um, something's ready. Just bring it up that uh, when you recorded that, um, when you put it together, uh, am I right that you didn't, you didn't really, at the, at the point you were playing and, and developing it, you didn't really have a sense of how all these bits fitted together? No, not at all. It wasn't until we finally put it all together, realised that one section was not quite in the same key. We had to sort of cheat a bit, you know. It was in the days of tuning, so they went, didn't quite line up. They weren't quite in key, so a semi-tone out. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer in, in luck. Something's just happened, you know, it's just luck and meant to be. And, and since then, all, all some of the best songs you've written has happened easily. Um, the, the, the fact that it's like 22, 23 minutes long, um, you know, you'd think that was a fairly adventurous thing to be doing. Um, but it did, it, you weren't daunted by that. I mean, there was no sense in which, hang on, you know, we've got to contain this and keep it down to sort of seven or eight minutes. Well, in those days, there were no real rules, you know? Um, we weren't putting singles out. A lot of bands weren't doing singles, really. There was a funny, there were two worlds. There was a singles world, the kind of pop band, sort of mud and piggity witch and, you know, and that lot. Um, and there was the album bands, and they weren't in the same area at all, so you weren't worrying about length of song. There were no constraints, which is nice. And also the other thing is that, I mean, I've said it before, but you know, we, no one ever said to us, can we hear what's going on? You know, from record label, you know, we'd handed me the album and that was it. Um, I see so many bands now being, you know, <coughs> A&R guys going in and listening and giving that two penny worth, and it, it's tough. I mean, maybe valid sometimes, but we, we had enough enough ideas within us to not ever want that. If you take that, um, that sort of period where you, you said you were all do, playing at your best, um, how would you characterize... Well, I actually meant that, I meant that song. You know, that song's an example of where all the bits we were doing all worked well. In the sense that the... the, the that you gelled as a, as a team, as a group, we're all, all contributing equally, I would imagine, at that point. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 bits vary, it always vary, but, um, 
uh, it's never good to go back and say who did what, because you know sometimes some sections are much more one person than another, um, and that's that's fair too. You know, that's the way it goes, really. And how how would you just talk about the individuals a little bit? How would you characterise uh, the contributions? I mean, we'll take Phil. As a, to yeah, I mean, he wasn't writing music per se at this stage, but his 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 input was like, for example, the 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 nine eight section instrumental section, which is a big part of the song, I think, actually leading to the end was was um, a jam, you know. And since drum machines, we all play in four four. It's dangerous. In those days, you could play around. I think it's in nine eight, but you played around it nicely. You know what I mean? It's sort of um, so you never quite settled on onto where you were, which I liked. Um, and then Tony had this long solo, which is once again adventurous. Um, and uh, but Peter himself. I'm trying to think. Uh, he's he comes in with, as you said, he sort of suddenly there's there's the arrival of this line or two lines of lyric. Um, was that something that you? was anticipated when you were, you were playing it. Well, Peter always caught the mood, but I think what, what always works is that you have to create a mood that's very special. Like the opening section has this eerie feel to it. And suddenly you're in a setting, you know, and it means you're going to lyrically, and lyrically and musically, melodically, you have to be in a certain area that marries that, you know. And so talk, uh, talking about Peter, the... the um, the different stages that Peter went through from initially in live and kept playing live, from um, you know being being the singer without a lot of props to the, the, the stage of being quite theatrical and having all, all the masks and so on. Was that a relatively short period of time? And how much did he kind of discuss this beforehand and lead you into it? Well, Pete, very sensibly, didn't discuss it at all with us, actually, because we'd have probably said, are you sure? Um, see, interesting point is what, what people forget is that because these things are talked about and the pictures of Pete with the bat wings, they're high points in the set, but they're only a fairly small part of the set. They kind of forget that, you know what I mean? It makes it sound like the whole evening was musical and he was always wearing clothes, and, but Bar the Lamb, which is different, it was just a, a kind of pinnacle at certain moments, like the old man in a musical box. The whole set wasn't like that. Most of it was just people playing and singing and banging his bass drum. You know, it's sort of people tend to think of it as more theatrical than it was. Until the Lamb. What was the impetus for doing this with, with him? I mean, what was it because he was the, there was a lot of hanging about between you know whilst you guys were playing? Well, that's the chat. That's what got going with the chat. Really. That's why he started doing such such good chat. Really, but no, I mean, I think the. The concept originally was partly, if I remember, was that you couldn't hear the words in those days because the PA was so crap. Little column speakers, you know, either side of the stage. And so the first thing was the old man, really, and I think that just he's act, acting out the part of the lyrics. And visually, it's very exciting. I mean, it was a great musical section, and I think his performance really enhanced it. It's, it's telling the stories, really. Remember the first time that. Uh you came on to the old man? Nope, I mean, uh, no, not at all. I mean, but no one does really. We see, uh, no, but sometime it was around, you know, it was obviously around that album time, so I don't remember. First show, I can't remember when it was, but it's sort of, um, but my point is, I want to get across is that, you know, people, because these have been such highly points, these have pictures of all these things, they seem like that was the whole show. It was, it was part of the show, and a, a great part, you know. And it, it, are you saying that the Jemsons became known for that? No, I'm saying more looking back, as history, history goes on, you, you end up, there, there, are hype, there, are, there are points you remember a certain album, an era or a tour, and there'd be those moments, you know, the Bat Wings or the Old Man, and they forget the show's an hour and three quarters maybe, and that's probably 15 minutes of the whole thing, you know. It's the sort of photo op moment. Isn't it? Well, but I'm saying it's how you remember these things, you know what I mean? And I think it's a bit like, I've said before, later on the albums, when we started having hit singles, you know, with MTV and videos, a hit single overshadowed the whole album. And people started sort of saying, well, you know, you stopped doing long songs. We never did, really. 
you know, every album had a sort of 50 minute song on it till the very end. But they're album tracks, and so they went on the television, they went on the radio, but live they were a big part of the set. And so, in a sense, those big hits overshadowed just in terms of media an album. Um, so their perception was the album's just hit singles, you know. Yeah, which is totally. Uh, which is fine, but well, you know, the albums like Visible Touch had uh, Domino on it, which is a, I think so, was it Domino? Yeah, great live song, 15 minutes ish. And then uh, the one with Mamma on it had Home by the Sea, you know. So, but people see it through the press, really, in many ways. In fact, things like Home by the Sea work very well live hmm. to a live audience. Well, I think what's interesting is that, is that I'm sure a lot of people came to see us in the 80s, late 80s and 90s in America because <coughs> of the singles, probably, you know. Uh, they were brought in because they'd heard the songs, you know. And, uh, but I, what, was, I, what was good is I always knew the long songs would always grab them. A, they were good songs. B, visually, they were very impressive with the very lights and staging. So in a sense, I think those who came to see us because of the singles and the short songs and the radio tracks went away with a different impression of us. I'm sure of that, yeah. <coughs> it sort of leads on to something I said. It's a stupid top. Mm. They are. Um, the, the, the thing that I think that a lot of people don't get is that yeah, there's this whole idea that if you love the early Genesis, you're not a fan of the yeah. later Genesis. Um, my sense is that uh, you know that, that the whole arc of your career, there's a, there's a continuity of sound, which it underpins the whole thing. Um, well, I would agree, but I mean, I think I have to accept that if you started off on a certain album <coughs> in the Peter area, that'll be your favourite era, probably always. Which is how it is. The first album you'd like a band for is probably always a favourite album. Um, and I understand that. But I mean, I agree. You know, I, I don't see such a huge change as, as is talked about in a sense. But then again, I suppose it has been. In a way, lyrically, it's almost a bigger change from the sort of Peter era and the kind of darker stories and the more folky mythology type things that Tim and I used to write. That's probably a big change from that to <coughs> um, later on. Those folky mythology things. Um, when, what, what were you trying to do at that point? I mean, uh, were you trying to be f folk musicians more than anything, or were you trying to push the envelope on the folk side? Trying to be edgier folk. You don't have a plan. You know what I mean? You d you're not ever thinking, let's do this, because you just sort of do what. You're trying to be different. Um, I mean, as be, I'm sure everyone's sort of told us you that, you know, when asked about our influences, we always say the Beatles and Motown, which we all share, but you can't hear that, obviously, in the song, but it's there somewhere, you know. Um, well, Motown is, it gives you a sort of soul. Yeah. I think that the... I think we were just trying to be a bit different. Um, because the canvas in those days, in the 60s and the 70s, was pretty blank. You know, there weren't that many bands on it. If you were drawing a canvas now, it'd be full up of everything. But in those days, there was sort of a couple of bands like that. There was bits of white in between the bands. You know, you could, you could, there was room to sort of define what you were going to become. It wasn't so obvious what was out there. Yeah, I mean, you could go to a festival in the early 70s, and there'd be a huge range of potential performers, you know. Well, before that, I mean, I remember seeing, I went to the, what's it, the Rainbow, it would have been the Rainbow, I think. Um, and the bill was Jimi Hendrix, Engelbert Humperdinck, the Walker Brothers, someone called the Californians, whoever they were. So, but you know, just Hendrix and Engelbert on the same bill. That's the way it worked then, it was pop music, you know, there weren't such defined categories now. In your uh, book, you described being in America on the, I think it was Steve Miller show. Steve Miller, great, great musician. Um, but uh, on came Peter with um, the shaved look on, the, on his head. And there was a kind of a, 
a shock ran, ran through the audience. Is, is that right? Would you like to tell that story? Well, it's more that you see Steve Miller, who is a great guitarist, and he's a kind of, it's kind of blues, really. Some great songs. <clears throat> you could see him looking at us and thinking, I mean, he watches the sky. You could see him thinking, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? It's just he couldn't get it at all, you know. Nor he would, because it's so, so bizarre, you know, from... And I think that very English folky thing in America was perceived as something very exciting, you know. It was just so unlike Americans, what was going on. And that kind of sound we were making in America, it was so different to... that. They were all full of boogie and, 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 and rock and roll and kind of blue stuff. So our sound was unique to them. Kind of why it worked in America, I think. It was just a completely new um, foreign platform of music, really. How do, how do you, I mean, looking back now, how do you see the, the, the sort of development of the American audience? Because you, if you go there with that English folky sound, edgy or folky, um, by 74, 75, you've got um, Lamb, which is has an American subject, it is much more rock, rock sounding, harder. Um, did, did people buy into that when they heard it first? Because you, you, there was no record out, was there? No, and that's a, a prime example of what not to do, is to go on tour with a new album, not released, and play the entire double album live. Funnily enough, it worked. I think we, well, we had, you know, we, at that stage, we were a large cult band. So they were coming to see you because they were like, they liked you. They were part of you, you they were new, you know, they were sort of part of your fans. It wasn't so much casual people. I guess brought in by, you know, word of mouth, but it was, um, they wanted to like us, but it was uh, quite testing actually. But the show still worked. So in the initial performances in America of Lamb, was there a kind of, um, uh, curiosity <coughs> well, no, I think I mean it was so different. I was opened in Chicago. I remember actually, I pictured the theatre too, the th three thousand seat theatre, and I'm pretty certain that, you know, it was such a multimedia kind of event. The Lamb with the screens, Pete's costumes, the music. It was just an assault on the senses, I think. And I think for, for the public, it was amazing. It hadn't been quite like it before, you know. Uh, visually, it was just it was just adventurous, really, and a bit theatreish. And I think, in a sense, that's that's probably why you always thought maybe there might be some sort of theatrical way of performing it. At some stage, you know, in this, it hasn't been done yet, and it may never be done. But I feel it could become a theatre piece. Maybe not even like London theatres. Maybe a sort of touring theatre piece, you know. But who knows? In writing the man. Um I know that there's, you know, there were a lot of problems, obviously, in, in getting that down. Um, uh, Tony Smith actually talked to, about how that, that this was a very tough thing to kind of get get through and get out and get on the road with. Um, what, what was your experience of it? Um, well, the house Hedley Grange, which, which was Zeppelin's house, we rented off them. Um, it was a funky old place, but it was a nice, nice atmosphere, a big sort of front living room you, you recorded and, well, wrote in, really. Um, <clears throat> first of all, double album is more work than you thought. It gave us more time, some of the sort of interesting little jams we had, you know, between the songs and stuff. Um, but I think really kind of overshadowed by kind of Pete leaving in the middle for that William Freakin thing, you know, which is, I can understand always. And there's a slightly strange feeling when one of the one of the one of the sort of guys you're working with isn't as keen as you are. It makes you feel a little less. It slightly dampens it a bit. And if all five of you are, we're five then are kind of into it and excited about it. You know, in the morning, it, it, it's a nice feeling in the chat in between. You know, it's a sort of team thing. You 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 feel off it. But if one person is not so sure about wanting to be there, it does rather damp. It, it did dampen the atmosphere a bit. Then he sort of left for a bit, and then I think William Freakin thought, hang on, I don't want to break the band up, you know, and it never quite came to, 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 to fruition, and he came back and we finished it off, but it, it made it funny all round, really. Can you recall when Peter first discussed the Lamb ideas? Was there a kind of 
group decision that, okay, we're going to be doing this American subject, uh, double album, concept album, something like We'd cool. agreed a double album. I mean, we'd agreed a concept album. But uh, it's the one time Peter did all the words himself by sort of one song. Maybe it had to be that way, I think, actually. You couldn't have sort of shared the words in the same way, in my mind. I'm sure Banks disagrees, but I think he probably couldn't have done. And I always feel it's part of Pete's decision when he, one of the reasons why he actually moved on after that, because having done a whole album of lyrical ideas like that, to go back to doing a single album and maybe sharing the lyrics is a different, almost a step back, really. I think so. And so I think for him, one of the reasons, apart from family reasons and, and, and everything else, is something that I'm sure he'd felt he'd sort of got to a point that he sort of moved on, really. I couldn't go back. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting that Peter's career then became a series of solo albums, um, and he's very much known as a solo artist. Were you guys still working, um, you know, either, either with Genesis or Mike and the Mechanics, in your case? You know, you're still working with with other people, you, you, it's like... Well, you must realise, you know, in order to be a solo artist, you have to be a singer. Without that, it's a bit tough, as I found out. Um, and so, but also I did a couple of solo albums, one with another vocalist and one with me singing, which I'll never do again, because it's, you write a good song, you want a great voice. Mm -hmm. And that great voice isn't me, without doubt. <clears throat> but I do like, I find the whether I'm less self-contained. I find the act of collaboration the exciting part. I mean, over the years, Banks and I kind of, the interaction of playing together, the chordal stuff and his lines over it, and he, uh, is, an, is a very exciting thing. You know, we'll go into a jam session maybe, you know, and it's a bit like playing tennis. I make a noise and he reacts to my noise. I react to his noise. Then it comes back to me. You're sort of, you're feeding off what the other person is doing. And Phil was drumming or singing, so that, that's part of the equation. But the kind of, the middle, the middle part of the sound, the chords, which creates the atmosphere in some ways, and some of the moods, has always been very much Tony in my role. And we sort of, we kind of do it together, I think. But it's very, it's very improvised, it's very freeform, it's very creative. And on my own, there's no one to play against. That's how I view it. You know, there's no, I play a chord, there's not something over there. It's a bit, I'm stuck, you know, I get no, I feed off a reaction. Yeah. I need to have that kind of um, churning of sound and messing of ideas, sort of melting pot of ideas, and then you react, which is why, you know, the mechanics has been great to, to co write with. Um, uh, and I think even if, I'd, even if I'd been a singer with a decent voice, I would have always, I think, probably carried on co writing because I like that.